Namaste everyone. I am Sugant Kanan and today I will be giving a presentation on scientific and mathematical achievement in ancient India. Before I begin, I would like to sing a Jain Bhajan. If you all know and can sing, please join. Arihanto ko namo nama, Siddhong ko namo nama, Acharyom ko namo nama, Jai Bolo Bhagavan Ki. Arihantong ko namo nama, Siddhong ko namo nama, Acharyom ko namo nama. Jai Bolo Bhagavan Ki, 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 Upadhyaya ko namo nama, Sarva Sadhu ko namo nama, Pancha Parmeshti Namo Nama Jai Bolo Bhagavan Ki 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 Namo Namo Arihantanam Namo Namo Siddhanam, Namo Namo Ayariyanam, Namo Namo Uvachayanam, Namo Loya Sarvasahunam, Namo Loya Sarvasahunam, Namo Loya Sarvasahunam, Jai Bolo Bhagavan Ki, 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 Jai Bolo Bhagavan Ki. So as you all know, today or tomorrow is going to be the Ram Mandir inauguration. And I want to highlight some of the key contributions from people of Jain faith for the Ram Janmabhumi. The one of the most important senior advocates in the Ram Janmabhumi, the Ayodhya case, is Hari Shankar Jain, and his contributions are very critical for the Prana Pratishta of that mandir. And also there is a uh, Jain business owner, Rajendra Kotarya from the Bengaluru region. He has manufactured and donated a Surya Tilak machine, which on Ram Navami will shine the light from the sun on the Ram Lalla Virajman idol. So I thought I should highlight that those two very critical contributions, and there are many more, of course. So now let us begin with a discussion on the ancient Indian science and mathematics. So I'm sure many of you have you know, studied mathematics in school and you've learned the formula a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And that is commonly referred to as the Pythagorean theorem. But this formula was actually discovered, developed and utilized very commonly in ancient India. And it's been given by Maharishi Bodhaira from the 8th century BCE. He has given it in his Sulba Sutra, where he says that the rope stretched along the diagonal of a rectangle makes an area which the vertical and horizontal sides make together. Now, how does that connect with the Pythagorean theorem? So if you take a rectangle and you draw a diagonal, you get two right triangles. And it's and that one of the right triangles is shown in the diagram below, and that diagonal is C, the hypotenuse of the right triangle, and the area which is formed by the diagonal or the hypotenuse 
is represented by the square, the green square. So that's C squared. And then the other two side lengths, the area of those, the pink and the beige squares, that's A squared and B squared. So that's how A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Uh, Bodhayana has also given an approximation of the value of square root of 2, which he says is 1 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 minus 1 over 3 times 4 times 34. And this is accurate to five decimal places. So now that we've established a geometrical foundation, we need to transition to the next level of mathematics, trigonometry. There was a mathematician by the name of Madhava. He is a Nambudri from Kerala who lived during the 14th and 15th centuries in ancient India. And at that time, you know, this was before India's independence. So at that time, there were a lot of kingdoms around India and they provided a lot of support in the form of universities, patshalas, like the one in this mandir. So they would provide donations and grants for those, those type of institutions for teachers and researchers to conduct in-depth research in the fields of science and mathematics. So in trigonometry, the main functions are sine theta, cosine theta, and tangent theta, as well as the respective uh, inverse forms of those functions. So Madhava, he has given the, now we call it the Taylor series, but he has given the infinite series of sine theta, cosine theta, and inverse tangent theta. So if you plug in, you know, the degree value in radians into these formulas, you can get the precise value for sine, cosine, and, and arc tangent. Of course, later on, the Westerners came along, and there's a, I'm sure those of you who have studied calculus, you've heard of a mathematician by the name of Wilhelm Leibniz. And so now they call it the Leibniz series, but it's actually the original name is the Madhava series. And, you know, Madhava, he also understood that pure mathematics is important, but application is critical too. So he developed what is known as the Madhava's sine table. And that lists all the values of sine theta from zero to 90 degrees. And that was utilized by people who build mandirs, palaces, and chariots for their calculations. And, you know, there was a very strong emphasis on mathematics in ancient India. You know, that's why if you look at a lot of the American companies nowadays, you'll find that they have an Indian origin CEO because of the innate mathematical talent that's in our DNA. Let me tell you a, a quick story about how a minister in a kingdom utilized mathematics to solve a major problem. So as I mentioned before, in ancient India, the system of governance was a monarchical system. Now, now the judiciary in India is separate. You have Supreme Court, you have the various high courts, district and municipal courts. But back then the king and the ministers, they were responsible for you know, conducting trials, taking evidence and passing judgments. So during this time, this, was a, this happened in the Vijayanagara kingdom headed by King Krishnadeva Raya. And there was a famous minister there by the name of Tenali Raman. So there was a dispute. There was a will dispute. You know, nowadays, will disputes are very common. A lot of conflict happens in families, you know, in US and in India. So there was a dispute in the will. It had been written that, you know, I have a certain batch of elephants that I own, the, the passed away father he had written. And the eldest son will be getting half of my elephants. The second son will be getting the two thirds of the remaining. And of the remaining, the balance two thirds will go to the third son. The challenge was there were 17 elephants. You know, one half of 17 is not a whole number. It's eight and a half. So you can't half an elephant, right? <laughs> so they came to the king and this dispute, you know, dragged on. Then the king appointed Tenali Raman one of the ministers, to solve this problem. And he came up with a beautiful solution. 
He borrowed one of the elephants from the king's quarters. So now you have 18 elephants. 18 divided by 2 is 9. So 9 elephants went to the first son. You have 9 elephants left. 18 minus 9 is 9. So 2 thirds of that is 6. So 6 elephants went to the second son. So now 9 minus 6 is 3. You have 3 elephants left. And 2 thirds of that is 2. So 2 elephants went to the third son. And now you have the balance one elephant which went back to the king's quarters. So, you know, everybody was happy and, you know, there was no net gain or loss to anyone. So what this shows is that, you know, we, you know, even now, so everyone here is originally from India, you know, from different states possibly. We all have that innate mathematical talent. And that's because there was an emphasis on math and science in ancient India. So now I want to talk about chess briefly. Chess is actually, you know, people treat it as a game, as a strategical game, but chess is actually a mathematical sport. In ancient India, chess was called Chaturanga. And in Gujarat, there's a place called Lothal, and they did an excavation there and found chess pieces and chess board. After doing the carbon dating process, they were able to find that these pieces and boards go back as far as 3000 BCE. And skilled chess players were giving, given support by the kings. So they also played blindfold chess, which is one of the modes of competition of chess. In fact, I am a very strong chess player. Does anybody play chess in the audience here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm a... <laughs> Yeah, I'm a two-time Florida State chess champion and one-time uh, national U.S. Open K-12 champion. So I have a strong interest in chess. And let me tell you a good story about how chess was invented. So back then, an old man, he invented chess and he brought it to the court of king in front of all the ministers and showed them the game. Mainly the goal was to impress upon the next generation of ministers' sons and their princes, the king's princes, that they can play chess and learn strategic principles through that. So the king was very happy and he told the old man, I'll give you any reward, please ask. And typically back then, you know, jewels, that was the, and gold coins, that was a common reward. But the old man said, you know, I'm very old man. You know, I don't need all this jewels and wealth. All I want is, look at this chess board. It's an eight by eight board with 64 squares. So on the first square, I want you to place one grain of rice. On the second square, two grains of rice. On the third, four grains of rice. On the fourth, eight grains of rice. And like that, the powers of two. So two is a very small number, right? So the king thought, you know, we are such a big kingdom. We can definitely supply this. So he appointed one of his ministers to handle this you know, reward process. One week later, the old man comes back to the king's court and says, I haven't received my reward yet. And the king asked the minister, you know, what's happening? This is a priority. This reward is needs to be fulfilled. To which the minister replied, you know, five, 10 squares, 20 squares, it was okay. But once we started to hit the 30th square, the number of grains ballooned to over 1 billion. And even if we bring all the rice grains in the entire kingdom, we won't be able to supply this. So the king says, okay, we can, I can't supply this, but I'll give you my whole kingdom. To which the old man, who was a very simple-minded person, said that, you know, that's not my goal, but rather what I want you to do is, I want you to introduce the playing and teaching of chess in all the schools and gurukuls in the kingdom so that all kids develop the strategic mindset from a very young age. And if you do the calculation for how many, you know, what the total is, it'll be two to the power of 65 minus one. That's the total number of grains of rice that will be required to fulfill that promise. So now having talked about mathematics, we need to go into physics. Any physicists or engineers in the audience today? Yeah, 
mechanics or electricity and magnetism mechanical mechanical engineering good so you know now everyone says when you when you study physics isaac newton from england is the father of mechanics but that's not exactly true in ancient india a lot of the laws of motion and gravity have been discussed in great detail in fact you know europe for europeans and westerners to discuss the con discover the concept of gravity you know it took galileo and the leaning tower of pisa for them to understand that and in the vaisheshika sutra which has been given by maharishi kanad in the 6th century of bc he has given all the laws of motion and gravity in that he says i mean it's in sanskrit but he says the change of motion is due to impress force and that's the first law of motion given by newton and then he says that the change of motion is proportional to the impressed force and is in the direction of the force that is the second law of motion which is given by isaac newton in the vectorized format and he says that action and reaction are equal opposite that is the third law of motion furthermore he also gives the law of gravitation that if not held by anything things would fall due to gravity so many of you are on who are present here or watching by a zoom are probably wondering you know this level of innovation is present in ancient india so why it is not being brought and taught at the global level the reason being all this is present in various uh, books and research manuscripts from ancient india but it has not been cataloged marketed and presented at the global level that's the main challenge and you know as you know westerners in the united states they are the king in marketing so there is actually a, one of the oldest scientific societies in the united states it's called the new york academy of sciences recently they started a program called the global stem alliance and i was invited to be the student committee chairman of that particular program and through that i helped organize programs to bring ideas from young scholars from over 68 countries you know scientific technological engineering and math based innovative ideas help them prototype develop and catalog that so that you know that way that you know the global knowledge can be shared collectively and developed so that's i was involved in that capacity so who likes eating sweets here everyone right you know the reason why we are able to eat kheer and sweets today is thanks to the pioneering achievements of ancient indians in ancient india we were the first to cultivate sugarcane at a industrial scale crystallize it refine it and it's in the form of jaggery you know that's the traditional form it's also the more healthy form compared to white sugar the bleached white sugar that's sold by dominos that's not so healthy that you put in tea and coffee the that's why i encourage all of you you know in all the recipes in your kitchen try and substitute jaggery in place of the white sugar and today sugar is a 78 billion dollar global market it's become a really big business but this process of refining and utilizing sugar is originally from india and this has been given in vishnugupta chanakya's arthashastra he mentions it and that goes back to the second century ce and also in the records of the gupta dynasty there's the records of taxation and regulation of these sugar refining factories and that's around 350 ce diamonds you know if you look at india's export data from 2023 you'll see that diamonds accounts for roughly 15% of the exports from india and today diamonds at the global level are a 100 billion us dollar market 
But way back in ancient India, they understood the science of gemology, but not just you know cutting and polishing gems. They also took pride in the work. There was a, the traders in gems. They developed a gem classification system as well as how to test gemstones in order to safeguard against counterfeits in the jewelry market. And you know, nowadays, the Westerners, they've developed a similar, they've copied it and developed a similar system, you know, VVS, VS, and there's also grades of colors of diamonds, like D through Z. And, but this has all been given in a text called the Ratna Pariksha, which dates back to 323 BCE. Any surgeons in the audience today? Or any physicians? Doctors, what what what's your practice? Anesthesiologist. And how about how about you, sir? Allergy. Allergy. Nice. So, you know, in the United States, a lot of the leading physicians, especially in fields like uh, ENT, gastroenterology, uh, cardiology, cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, they're all people of Indian origin, but. If you look back in ancient India, around the 7th century BC, we have produced the world's first surgeon by the name of Shushuda. And not only producing the surgeon, he was also, so if you look in some of the top universities like Penn Medicine, Harvard Medical School, you will find that a lot of the practicing physicians, they are also engaged in medical research. But this concept was put into practice by Shushuda long before. He also engaged in medical research. He conducted some of the first dissections of the human, human body, identifying the organ systems in, you know, present in humans, giving diagrams, which are still found in the Shushuta Samhita of the various organs. There's also discussion of you know, possible preventative measures and cures for a common disease, which is known as angina or heart pain. But one of the most important achievements of Shushuta, I think, is that he is the world's first plastic surgeon. You know, today, plastic surgery is a very big business. You know, globally, it's a $55 billion market. But Shushuta is the one that performed the first rhinoplasty you know, rhinoplasty is a nose-based cosmetic surgery. So he would take a flap of skin from the cheek and transplant it onto the nose. And this was, he also used to collect a lot of fees for doing this, you know, and he used to utilize those fees to conduct his research and also, you know, teach his disciples and, you know, use it for good purpose. That's very important. The money that you make you need to donate and use it, utilize it for good purpose. And this rhinoplasty was very popular among the daughters of nobles in ancient India, as well as you know princes, princesses, and queens. But this cosmetic surgery and rhinoplasty technology was also utilized for good purpose. You know, in, in back then there was also burn victims, so they would utilize this principle of skin grafts in order to help rehabilitate and cure them as well. Another critical innovation of Shushuda Ji is the development of surgical tools. He developed forceps, surgical ham medical hammer, scalpels, and many other tools, which he diagrams in his, in his text. And as I mentioned in the bio, you know, I come from a Vedic background and I'm a direct descendant of Atreya Maharishi. And in the Mahabharata, Bhishma, he writes that Atreya Maharishi who is the one who received the Ayurvedic knowledge and transmitted it across India. So from a very young age, I understood that and I was motivated to do something good in the field of medicine. So I conducted scientific research with Nobel Prize winner and looking at that, I was invited by Harvard Medical School to conduct research in the field of biopharmaceuticals and drug discovery. And I developed scientific and mathematical models for the same. 
And looking at that, MIT has awarded me and named an asteroid in outer space in my name. So one day, you know, I hope to visit that asteroid. <laughs> You know, with the, with the young minds, the young bright minds in the audience, I'm sure that will be possible. So tonsil inflammation, strep throat, these are all very common diseases. But back as far as 1000 BCE, the tonsillectomy procedure has been described in Indian literature. Today, it's valued at globally at a $700 million market, you know, removing, removing tonsils. And let, let me tell you an interesting story about tonsils. You know, back in, back in, the, in ancient India, there was a king by the name of Akbar, and he had a minister, Birbal. So one day, Akbar, he came down with this uh, tonsillitis disease, with his in, tonsils were inflamed, he couldn't swallow. I'm sure many of the physicians know the common symptoms of the disease, very painful and uncomfortable. So the royal physician came and he consulted with Akbar, did all the examinations, and he told him, he gave him some medicine, but he told him that you need to swallow this medicine together with bull's milk. Now Akbar asked him, you know, I've only heard of cow's milk. I've never heard of bull's milk. How, how is that possible? But... And this doctor, he had a previous tiff with Birbal, the minister of Birbal. So he wanted to create some kind of conflict here. You know, in the workplace, they call this Ladai, they are, you know, workplace politics. So he wanted to create some kind of conflict and pull down Birbal because Birbal was known for solving any type of problem, any situation or problem or conflict that he came across. He was known for solving it. So he wanted to break that reputation. You know, the workplace, business, or career, your reputation is very important, right? You know, based on your reputation, that's why people who have worked in a particular field for 20 to 30 years, they're able to command high fees. They're able, you know, they're given great awards. They are the head of the association, you know, American Medical Association or other, other organizations like that. So like that, Birbal had developed a strong reputation in Agra and the surrounding surrounding kingdom. So the Akbar called Birbal and he told he narrated them narrated to him this entire episode, and to which Birbal was shocked too. He said, "You know, bulls they can't give milk. Only cows can give milk." But Akbar said, "You know, you are able to solve every single major problem in this kingdom. So I trust you to solve this problem as well." So Birbal said, okay, I'll find a solution. Then Birbal, you know, being a minister, he attended to various problems and court cases that had come, you know, people had come with their problems. He dealt with that. And then in the evening, just like, you know, minister, it's a, it's a big post, but ultimately at the end of the day, everyone is a human, right? So he went back home and his wife had cooked a very nice chapati and sabji for him. So he ate that and his daughter was also there. So they were discussing about this whole episode over the dinner table. And his daughter being you know, born in the people's household is very sharp, right? So she said, I've come up with a solution for this challenging predicament. And it'll also cure, you know, it'll, it'll help solve Akbar's tonsillitis problem. <laughs> In the late night, she took the clothes from the house and went to the banks of the Yamuna River and started cleaning them very loudly in the water, making a lot of splashing noise and also making thud noises, you know, slapping it on the rocks. That's the you know traditional. Nowadays, everyone puts it in the GE washing machines. They have the latest, you know, ecologically friendly washing machines. But, you know, back then, washing by the riverside and the gods. That's a traditional method of washing clothes. And I think that's actually a little bit better because you know, no matter how much companies market that you know, their washing machines are the best, you put the tight detergent and everything will come clean. I think the traditional method of washing clothes in India makes the clothes very, very clean and also without wrinkles. 
Because nowadays, if you put it into the dryer without, you know, without the fabric softener, the clothes become very wrinkled, right? So she started doing this, and the spot she chose was very strategic. Because Akbar's palace was right on the banks of the Yamuna River, and she, being the daughter of the minister, she knew where his bedroom window was. So she was doing this near his bedroom window, and Akbar was a little bit of a light sleeper. So he got, he woke up quick, and he got frustrated. You know, kings back then, they had, they had a lot of power, they had a lot of ego. So he told his guards, you know, go and figure out what's going on. Is it is it an enemy spy? you know, trying to do preparations for an attack on our kingdom. So the guard went over there and he asked this, uh, this daughter of Birbal, he asked her, who are you? To which she said, I'm a human being and a girl. Then the guard getting a little frustrated, he said, you know how, you know how police are in India, right? You have to answer them straight forward. Otherwise they get a little frustrated and get angry and they take the next steps. So this guard asks, whose daughter are you? And she says, my father's. So he gets even more frustrated. And she asks, who's your father? She said, my mother's husband. So he said, <laughs> he said, you know, it's time for you to go meet the king. Let's see what punishment he gives. You're impeding my investigation. So the guard goes before, before Akbar and he narrates this whole episode. And Akbar also being you know, a little cranky and having been woken up at the late time, late night time, he tells he asks, he asks her, you know, why, why are you washing clothes this late at night? And there's a certain time and place for you to wash clothes. This is not appropriate. You know, curfew has already been, you know, everybody's sleeping. To which the daughter said, you know, my father, he has given birth to a baby this afternoon. And, you know, I had to help with all that. But not, so that's why I'm having to wash the clothes in the evening so that it can be worn in the morning tomorrow by the family. Akbar was shocked. He said, how, how can a father give birth to a baby? Only, only mothers give birth to a baby, right? To which Birbal's daughter replied, well, if a bull can give milk, then certainly a father can give birth to a baby too in this kingdom. You know, a lot of strange things are happening in this kingdom. A king is giving order to procure bull's milk. So certainly a father can give birth to a baby. Akbar was a bit shocked and he understood that she must be a relative of Birbal. So he asked her, who are you and who is your family? She said, my father is Birbal. So Akbar said, you know, I have received the bull's milk. You know, I will please go tell your father Birbal that, you know, his task has been accomplished. But the girl, if she goes back, her father may not believe her. So she said, you know, how will she, how will he believe me? To which Akbar, he went to his desk wrote on a piece of paper, royal, you know, official proclamation paper, he wrote, the bull's milk has been received through your daughter. And he put the official royal stamp. She went back and gave it to Birbal, and Birbal understood everything. Next day in the court, where all the ministers and physicians are there, Birbal presented this proclamation to Akbar, and it was read. And the physician was shocked as to how the bull's milk could have been procured. And he understood the greatness of Birbal. And pretty soon, Akbar's tonsillitis got cured. So what this shows is that, you know, in ancient India, we have always, you know, prioritized meritocracy. People in professions who have achieved very strong and made great achievements, they are given their due respect. So now I want to talk about uh, Jain mathematics. In Jain mathematics, you know, the, in contrast to some of the Hindu mathematics, there's always an emphasis on pure mathematics. In fact, in ancient India, uh, Jain mathematicians were the originators of the study of pure mathematics. And there's an emphasis on large and infinite numbers. And there's a text called Surya Prajnapti, which in which there is a discussion on number theory and real theory. It classifies the entire set of numbers into three categories. Innumerable numbers, these are, you know, common numbers that we utilize in daily commerce, 1, 100, 100,000. And you have innumerable numbers. These are very large numbers that are finite, so, but they are, you know, large numbers, such as 1 trillion, a gajillion. 
and then infinite numbers. That is a boundless quantity. You know, similar to how mother's love for child or devotion for and respect for the Tirthankaras. That's the boundless and infinite quantity. But not only this classification of numbers, there has also been a discussion on the various subsets of infinity. And this was only discussed you know, on the Western by Western mathematicians, a uh, person by the name of John Napier in the 18th, 18th century. So this has just been discussed by Jain mathematicians long before that. You know, there's infinity in one direction, infinity in two directions, infinite area and perpetual infinity. So one direction is positive infinity. Two directions is, you know, if you take a XY coordinate plane from negative infinity to positive infinity, an infinite area that, and perpetual that brings in the time dimension. So that's where you get multivariable calculus and Fourier transforms. And also in the ninth century CE, there was a Jain mathematician by the name of Mahavira Acharya. He lived in the Mysore region of Karnataka. He wrote a book called the Ganit Sarasangraha. And you know how previously I talked about how in ancient India, they didn't really catalog and talk about terminology. Well, he is very unique. Before mathematics was a little bit unorganized, but he developed terminology and a systematic way of mathematic education that was propagated to other students of Jain mathematics. Furthermore, he developed the theory of imaginary numbers. So you know, there's real numbers and there's imaginary numbers. Imaginary numbers are like square root of negative numbers, which is I. And also he developed a nice solution, you know, how to find a solution for a least common multiple of a group of numbers. So like this, there are many other inventions, scientific and mathematical in ancient India. I'd like to end with a nice story. Recently, there was a Gujarati industrialist by the name of Banwarlal Raghunath Doshi. His net worth is 600 crores. He's the owner of a company in India called DR International. It's a plastics manufacturing and trading unit. He started long back borrowing 30,000 rupees from his father. You know, they were in Rajasthan at the time. And he came to Delhi, took the risk and started this unit, which has now blossomed into a big business. Recently, you know, having developed the business, and of course, there's a lot of stress and challenges that come with that. He realized that the best way to find peace is to become a Jain Acharya. So in Ahmedabad, recently he arranged for a big ceremony and became the 108th Shishya of a Jain Acharya. Gautam Adani was also present in that function. And in that, uh, Banwar Lalji, he says that he has been listening and learning from Jain Pravachan for over 30 years. So what this shows is that in spite of our professional backgrounds and you know what work we are engaged in on a daily basis, you know, for the sustenance of family and whatnot, it shows that there is a lot more that is to be learned from Jainism. And with that, I would like to conclude and open the floor for question and answer from the audience. Can I ask one question? Yes. You talk about the chase, but I thought before the chase, if the what Gujarat is called the Chopat, Chopat is supposed to be the most ancient day. Am I right? The one which yeah, 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 yes. Yes, yeah, that, that's what I mentioned when I was talking about when I was talking about chess. You know, nowadays uh, in Italy, Italy is where the modern rules of chess were developed. But you know, let me go back to that slide. You know, chess originally was called uh, Chatura, and they had a slightly different set of rules for how you know how chess was to be played, but the origin of playing this type of game on the Ashtapada or the eight by eight board, that's from India. And many of the rules are similar. Uh, of course, the piece names are different. You know, King is called Raja, Queen is called Rani, uh, Rook is called 
you know, Gaja. So like that, there are some minor differences. And in the bishop, in the mantri, the bishop, there are some minor differences in the rules and the movements of the pieces. But that that game got, you know, it was exported from India to, you know, via the Arabic countries and Persian traders to Europe. And then they developed the modern rules of chess. But it's originally from India, Chaturam. But Chopin is not like square movement. Plus, like, plus 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 plus. Plus. Oh, that's that's the Pachisi you're talking about. Yeah, because yeah it's it, it'll be like it'll be like a square like that square. Yeah. Square plus, plus, sign. Sign. plus sign. Yeah. So that that game was also very popular. That's a slightly different game. That game was you know it's before Chatura, like you mentioned, and that game is also uh, very popular. In fact, the uh, that yeah. game. Well, Mahabharat, yeah, the, the dice game. That's that's the game that was played by uh, Yudhishthir and Shakuni. And, you know, a lot of strategic thinking, a little bit of luck involved in that game too, of course. Of course, if you're if you're in Mahabharat, if you're playing against Shakuni, there's not that much luck involved, you know. The game outcome is already predetermined. But yeah, that's also one of the, the traditional games. And then, you know, nowadays they call uh, Mankala, the the marbles with the with the holes the the two rows mm -hmm. so that's also another traditional game from from India. I want to add about uh, you know, ancient uh, things and the rules about boiling water. It's uh, you know it's quite in this epic pleasure you you know to have. <clears throat> Now, you know, everybody knows that, okay, you need to boil water and then you put it in the, you know, that sink. This comes back, you know, many centuries ago, and then they knew how to, you know, boil the water and then flood that sink. And another thing was the roots, uh, and you know, the peas and potatoes and right. things are developed. Uh, Below the ground, and the ground has lots and lots of bacteria. So, if you get any roots but don't boil it or clean it very well, you're going to get sick. And probably they knew it way back about all these antiseptic measures and what bacteria and viruses are, and they put it in their regular, normal routines to have this boiled water, not having any. <laughs> right. Yeah, that they had a very deep understanding. And in fact, if you they have done uh, excavations of the Indus Valley civilizations, and you know, belief is that it got wiped out by flood, possibly. And they checked, and in fact, looking at the construction and excavations, they were able to find that there were water supply lines, there were toilets. And also, uh, you know, waste drainage lines as well. So that that was, you know, that kind of technology was developed in ancient India and in Bharat long, long before. And in fact, you know, I mentioned I've done research with Nobel Prize winners. I recently, you know, on their encouragement, I started an organization called American STEM Institute, and we are planning on opening an office this year in India where we bring and encourage inventions from semi-urban and rural markets in India. Because there's a lot of invention and ideas in those pockets of India, but it's not being brought to the global stage. So our idea is to you know, identify, help them prototype and develop that, you know, patent it and bring it to the international market and sell it a profit so that you know, our organization can make money and also the inventors can be supported and make money as well. The plastic surgery, now it is recognized here also that it started from India. And they give an example in Junagar, it is a town in Samarashtra, Gujarat. Right. That's where they used to polish before the, some people to cut the nose. Right. And that plastic surgery about uh, Few hundred, 200 years ago or something started reconstructing nose and that's where plastic surgery started mm -hmm. and it is recognized all over the world that 
plastic surgery or the recent modern plastic surgery came from Junagadh, started from Junagadh. Right. It's actually quite possible, you know, that if you if you check the ancient history of where Shushuta lived, you know, he was in that airy region of Northwest India. Of course, they traveled a lot and the records are a little bit sparse, but it's quite possible that, you know, he developed and then that got handed through practitioners down the line and then it became developed in a modern sense in June Garden. Now it's a global business. Right. But even plastic surgery books mentions that uh, it started in Junagat in plastic surgery books. Yes. What do you do for lately? I run a management consult. I went to Warden Business School. So I run a management consulting business focused on healthcare and real estate management. So in phys physical and group practices and hospital systems, when they want to expand to new markets, I do a lot of consulting for them on those types of projects. And furthermore, you know, I also do consulting and you know for real estate, pure real estate development projects as well. Yeah. So I travel around the country, and you know, when I have time, so I do provisions like this in mandirs. Uh, around the country, you know, to spread good message. Sir, you had a question? Yeah, uh, you mentioned, I mean, it's a matter of pride for us that most of the invention of scientific stories were done hundreds of thousands of years ago before Western world. Right. right. It is also unfortunate that it was not globalized or marketed at that time uh, for us to get benefit out of it. Right. Now that you're part of such research and organizations, do you know any or couple of significant inventions which were done before and which are written in our books for Western world to not be like that? So that we wake, wake up late and you know, still start marketing that. Right. I mean, actually, if you look at it, uh, organizations like NASA and the Department of Energy, you know, they're involved in uh, nuclear technology. Uh, those laboratories, they actually understood what I'm talking about at a very early stage. So, you know, they've done research on a lot of these, uh, usually it's written on palm leaf manuscripts or those types of uh, articles. So they have deployed scientists and teams from here to India to conduct research. So a lot of the inventions have actually been identified by Western teams of scientists and, you know, they're utilizing it for their own benefit. But you know, further research is being conducted in uh, universities like Banaras Hindu, Hindu University and you know other other institutions around the country. They are still conducting research, and of course, there's a lot more to be discovered. In fact, in my lecture, I mentioned the uh, Chanakya Arthashastra that was actually discovered by a researcher in the Karnataka region. You know, when he was per perusing through the manuscripts, and suddenly he came across it. And he published it and distributed it, you know, at a at a national level. You know, people talk about Machiavelli and Karl von Clausewitz and Sun Tzu as being the propagators of military and geopolitical strategy. But you know, in the Gupta Gupta dynasty, Chandra Maurya, Chandra Gupta Maurya, they they all you know knew this long time before. So I mean, yeah, there are there are more innovations, and recently, you know, startups are really booming in India. There was recently a pharmaceutical discovery utilizing the, you know, the strands and fibers from coconuts. So they, they utilize that to develop a sort of pharmaceutical medicine. It's in the early stages, but I'm sure it's been given support by the Tamil Nadu government, but I'm sure it will become, you know, commercialized in a few years. Yeah, the problem is that all of the manuscripts that we have, right. the Muslim came and almost everything they burned and destroyed it. Right. And the Britishers and the, even the Hitler took a lot of stuff and they are in the museum and all around the place. We don't have access to them. Right. And lots of lots of manuscripts. Yeah, actually, on, on that point, I wanted to mention, you know, I talked about Ram Mandir, but, uh, you know, in, in Delhi, there's this place called Kutub Bina, right? And I mentioned the learned senior advocate, Harishankar Jain. He founded the organization Hindus for Justice, but through that, he is also doing a lot of good work for Jain temples as well. So they have filed a case in the high court now to you know, reclaim the Kutub Minar and, you know, rebuild a lot of the Jain temple complex that was present in that area. What do you think? We were so smart, all those things. But why we could not defend ourselves? Hindu, Jain, whatever. We've been ruled by Muslims, British, 
before that, what, what is the reason? Are you basically coward people? Or why we cannot the, make a devotion? Well, I, I think actually we're, we're very brave people. Uh, if you look at, you know, the, the ex, exploits and success of people like Shivaji Maharaj. But, uh, you know, if you, have you watched the Chanakya serial? Anybody watched it? Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, if you look around the 13th or 14th episode of that serial, you know, when the Alexander is invading, you will see that Vishnugupta, yeah, uh, Vishnugupta Chanakya, he is emphasizing that the provinces of the Northwest, which is in present day Punjab, that they need to unite because if they stand divided, it's hard to, you know, you need to give a unified front. In fact, that idea is utilized in the American Revolution as well. You know, united we stand, divided we fall. But unity is very important. That's the main challenge in, you know, to bring this to the global level and why we were victims of military conquest is there was inter, intra border conflict between various kingdoms. And then we had traitors also. Right. Coming from the royal family. Of course. Yeah, people, so in India, you know, the tradition is the eldest son is the one who gets coronated. But you would have some of these second sons and third sons creating, you know, bringing in the foreigners and creating problems. So, talking about these examples that we already have proven that they were invented or thinking about them like much before. And when you attend all those kind of conferences, at least now people are realizing that India was going to change. Because yeah, the they, they, system is still here, like you know, but... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they, they, they definitely are realizing, but I think the challenge with a lot of these conferences, you know, there's, there's you know, global conferences and national conferences that are happening in the United States. The problem is only that Indians are the ones who are understanding this. You know, we need to disseminate this to Europeans and Americans so that they understand. And a lot of them are curious nowadays. So that's why I encourage each one of you, you know, pick something from this presentation that you really resonated with you or something else that you may know and you know, in your workplace or maybe even in the grocery store, you know, your public here, you know, if you meet somebody or in a colloquial setting, you can tell them about, you know, one of these inventions. You know, you, I give you a challenge, tell at least five people before the end of January. <laughs> To get the message. Okay. Um, I have a question. Since this is a lot of Asian comparison to the present time, and you know, the um, end of the day, and now that I'm in this thing, and so many schools are coming out, you know, they're so good. Right. Have you ever thought about how to make India, Bharat, and you know, how everybody's claiming that our our uh, rules, our king and this and that, and you discuss on that, our rules and rules of the Well, I mean, India anciently, you know, this. So there's a lot of problems for you on that. Right, right, yeah. You know, recently the G G20 summit, the invitation, the Indian delegation, the foreign ministry, they published the invitation with the name Bharat, not India. And you know the name Bharat it comes from you know Mahabharat. That's how that's how it came through. You know, Chakravarti Bharat, who is one of the ancestors of the Pandavas and Kauravas, you know, he conquered the entire of India. So that's how the name Bharat came, and that's how the Akhand Bharat and all those concepts came. But originally, you know, India it's, it is a group of provinces with various kingdoms that are you know fighting against each other, and also. A lot of the kingdoms, like if you take the Shorya dynasty from southern India, they've actually conquered parts of, you know, present-day Vietnam. So that's why you have the Angkor Wat uh, temple and also Indonesia, uh, Sri Vijaya kingdoms in the Malaysia and Malacca Straits. So I think, uh, you know, the Indian concepts and ideas have actually traveled a little bit further than, you know, what is currently modern. And also, you know, the, so like that, you know, there's a... Right. Yes. 
you heard me. I have a question for you. You mentioned uh, the book of maths with the imagined numbers and stuff. Is that book like anywhere online? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are certain books that are online. You know, a lot of them you can find it on uh, it's a website called archive.org. You know, they publish them. And also Google Books, if you order online, you can find. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, most of the, those kind of copies, that's a little bit more of a rarer manuscript. So those types of copies, you would probably have to find a specialty bookstore in India to buy. I know a lot of uh, the Hindu books, they have the Gita Press in Gorakhpur, but I'm sure for the Jain manuscripts, there's also, you know, similar bookstores, possibly in the regions of Gujarat as well, that you can order. Yeah, that you can, yeah, that you can order and, so you mentioned you are part of American STEM Institute or Indian American? Yeah, it's, it's American STEM Institute. The website is American STEM Institute.us. Okay. You mentioned you're working with uh, rural and like not like my urban researchers and so on. Anyway. Yes. Um, is there a reason to not do this with some more uh, smarter minds and some good schools or universities like I, but I know I did that. Right, right. Like, I think we keep playing this victim's card, right? Google said this to us, and British have said that to us. We all know that. You know, right. We have a great history. And it, in the present modern India, we all know what we have, what the capabilities are. Do you believe that uh, we are invested enough to <clears throat> to sort of get the best out of ourselves? Birth of this playing the victim card, you know, like, oh, they took everything away from us. Right. I mean, if you look at it from the victim card perspective, I think, you know, that kind of talk has, has been, you know, it's been propagated. But nowadays, you know, the dynamic and level of India and the geopolitical stage is changing. Uh, you know, coming to partnering with, you know, top institutions in India, uh, there's already a lot of support from the Indian government to various state startup funds for ideas and concepts in those universities. But there's a lot of unique ideas from regional universities in India. So that's that's our primary focus. And you know, many of them are top institutions. You know, nowadays IIT through you know has been talked about, and of course it's a top institution, but there are a lot of very good regional universities as well. And actually, uh, you know, I talked about geometry and trigonometry. I wanted to highlight one more uh, invention. There was a uh, astronomer by the name of Bhaskarov. He lived in the Ujjain region. And when he was doing a lot of this astronomical research, this is long before Europeans, they were living in the dark ages. They still thought that, you know, Earth is the center of the solar system, sun is not. So, and then Copernicus came and, but actually when they were doing this astronomical research and studying the elliptical path of travel, a lot of calculus concepts Came, came into play, you know, instantaneous rate of movement of various planets. So in that process, they developed, you know, without calling it by that name, they developed and discovered mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem, which are, you know, very important theorems for the foundation of uh, single variable calculus. So Hanuman Talisa Gopal, uh, how many years back? I think it was sometime around the 16th century, if I'm correct, where there was a lot of uh, bhakti movement in India. So there were composers like Tulsidas and Ramdas. They composed a lot of these, you know, a lot of these poems and songs and bhajans like Hanuman Chalisa, Marathi Stotra, and others like that. So that time they knew the distance between the sun and the earth. Yes, definitely, because there's a lot of us. I don't know how long before that the knowledge was there, but the description is there in Anuman Jalil. Right. Um, just looking do you have any book recommendations, like published book recommendations for teenagers and for us to you know, kind of read to get to know more about the uh, Indian history and science reading? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are there are certainly a lot of books, but you know, you come and meet me afterwards. I'll send you, you know, it depends on what your interests are. So I'll give you a few recommendations. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that Indian scientists came up with uh, single multi-variable calculus before Newton 
You mean were were their techniques similar to Newton's techniques? I would say they were uh, you know markedly similar, but they were they were earlier. And of course, you know, there were some unique techniques as well. Because there's a lot of invention, you know, we have a 45 minute, one hour presentation. So I covered some of the major ones, but you know, if you go and read a lot of the texts that have been authored by these stalwarts, you will find they also given a lot discussion on a lot of other, you know, other topics as well. In the minutia, real number theory and imaginary number theory, but you know, the audience is a general audience, not necessarily mathematicians here. These, uh, like, you know, I would say, uh, you know, claiming of that different, you know, by this alien, that alien, that far back, how much is really have that by a solid documentation? Well, I mean, it's all pretty much by, backed by the primary source. You check, you know, they have looked at the manuscripts and that's how they, you know, they identify. And it is backed by a source. Why? Yeah, I mean, there, there are discussions to improve the history, but for that, like I mentioned to the answer, you need a unified front and a government, right? What about the government? <laughs> I think Indian history is already accounted for those. Uh, you're to global history. Well, yeah, the global history. That's what I mean. You need a unified front in the global history. Even Indian history, it's recently changed. But when the Jawaharlal Nehru came, he has completely modernized Indian history. He moved everything for the first 24 years of the Indian history. There was no mention of all the very So that's the biggest issue we that with Jawaharlal Nehru. I, I always mentioned yeah. due to you know after independence, yeah. if Sardar Vallabhai Patel yeah. was not given the task to unify the country because Nehru is what he it's actually came from uh, Southern Indian Raja. <laughs> this idea is if you keep Sardar Vallabhai Patel here, you won't be able to become a prime minister. <laughs> So give him a task, say you are the Iron Man and go unify the nation. So he's busy with other activities. So you can become a prime minister. And actually, Rajaji is the one who came up with adding funding to Jawaharlal Nehru's name. He was no funding. Rajaji said, this is the only way you're going to get award from every Indian, from every politician around the country. So we will call to funding Jawaharlal Nehru's name. That's how he became prime minister, and then Rabbi Patel was busy with actually putting India together. Right. Because if Mr. <coughs> Patel was going to be the prime minister, the India today would have been so much different because your generations were not taught about Satyabhati Shivaji and Chandra Gupta. So many findings, you know, the steel. Yeah, so if you look at, if you look at, uh, I mentioned about Department of Energy, there's a, there's something called Woods Steel, that's the English name for it. It's a knife that, you know, it's very hard to destruct it because of its special metallurgical properties. And that was, you know, back in India, I mentioned jewelry, but we were also very strong in metallurgy. If you look at Arthashastra, in the administration section, he talks about how there was a ministry of mines and how mining was a very critical activity for the economic well-being of the kingdom. So through those, you know, knowledge of metallurgy, and we're also the inventors of how to, you know, properly mine and refine zinc. So through that, they developed this, uh, this wood steel sword, which was very hard to break in fighting. And now there are researchers from the Livermore National Laboratory, which is one of the nuclear laboratories in the Department of Energy. They have tried to reconstruct that but to date, they still haven't been able to reconstruct, you know, the exact uh, steel. And also on the on the topic of uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, you know, you mentioned the Jungad province. He was very instrumental in making sure 
that that stays within India. In fact, uh, next Sunday, I have been invited by the uh, Hindu temple next door to on Republic Day to give a presentation on him. So I, you know, if you're interested, please come and contact me and I'll tell you how, I'll give you the information on attending. There's a question there, Patrick. Yeah. Right, yeah, actually, if you look at the, you know, everybody in America, they, they really talk about, oh, queen inauguration, queen this, queen that, it's really like a big thing. But, you know, I don't pay too much attention to that. But actually, if you look at the English crown, the diamonds on the crown are the Kohinoor diamonds from India. And also, so, I mean, a lot of the wealth was transferred by rail to India. You know, the rail system was not de developed in India for the purposes of transport. I mean, now it's being used, but, you know, it was developed for the purposes of transferring the wealth. And back then we had, you know, kings had built big temple uh, complexes. So actually, if you look in Kerala, there is a famous uh, Ranganath Swami temple in uh, Trivandrum. So in there, they have identified recently chambers. There's three chambers and they are, you know, sealed with this kind of Naga mantras and snake mantras. And in that, it, there's a lot of the temple wealth that has still been safeguarded. So they used to you know, put a lot of the wealth into the temple walls and make it very challenging to open. So that, that was one way of protecting some of the wealth. But yeah, I think India, you know, the current leadership, they are, you know, making steady steps toward reclaiming some of the, you know, idols and, you know, diamonds and other wealth. Yes, reclaiming that is important for our pride. But what new we are creating, what innovations we are doing, right? I think somewhere in the century we have lost that innovative uh, focus and we are just relying too much on what our ancestors have done and talking about that. I mean, any, any thought on that? Right, yeah. I mean, for innovation, you know, back then you needed uh, strong, back then you had strong government support. So they would give, you know, grants of universities and lands to, you know, people who wish to do this kind of research and support them. And of course, give them rewards when they find interesting innovations. Now, the, you know, when you try to do those kind of things, a lot of politics comes in because, you know, back then it's a monarchical system. So you're able to, you know, it's a one-man leadership, like how in a company you have one, see any business owners here? Okay, so when you have when you have a CEO of a company, it's a top-down uh, environment. But now we have a constitutional structure and a federal structure, so there's a lot of state versus federal conflict, and you have regional parties too. So there's a bit of challenge in that. I have a similar question to this. Do you think it's really worth all the effort to rewrite global history, but putting all the globalization? Like, does it really matter? I, I think both are important because when you when you put the effort into talking about the history of India, it motivates young people who study that in India to do the innovation. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle. Brings the pride back. Yeah, brings the pride back and confidence, you know. Like you mentioned, Hanuman Chari said, the confidence is very important for succeeding in any endeavor. Even for COVID 19 vaccine. I mean, like yeah, in the medicine, India is a far away. <laughs> like most of the medicine not researched. Yeah. 
Yeah, when I mentioned, you know, 15% export of gems, uh, pharmaceuticals and medicines accounts for another 10 to 15% of exports. So those are the two. And then, of course, textiles. So what we need, like, I mean, we are all migrated here in Winchester. In a journalism books, I mean, like, I mean, here we don't go more, but there are so many journalism books. They talk about this uh, astrophysics, physics, right? Uh, nuclear physics, uh, and all. Our new generation should take an interest. Some of the things there, the Western science is saying is Bakbar. We, we should study and prove it. You know, scientifically, we prove it that this theory or whatever that is written, it's right. And that's what's needed. There are still a lot more. Of course. In the Indian uh, books and uh, stuff. That's nobody else. And then, like, even our kids, like, you know, in a journey, we tell so many things. Yeah. And we tell our kids, about, tell Pakistan, say, no, it's Bakbar. I mean, like, why you go? You know? Well, spend a time. You know, we were it three thousand years, three years ago. Knew it about it. You know? so that's right. the main thing that we need. Why did you give this a forecast? Now, as people listen to the forecast. Oh, you mean like the astrological yeah, forecast? Forecast. Forecast. Po podcast. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll look into that. If you have any contacts, you know, you, you, you let me know. I'll come, on, I'll come on. I'll come on any show and talk about it. Now I just keep the list of what? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I have a question. Do you personally believe in things like astrology in Korea time? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I actually. In the bio, I briefly discovered uh, discussed it, but I actually come from a, a Vedic background back in back in India. My great grandfather, they were very esteemed and learned pundits. So those that's who I learned all the knowledge from, and he was one of the chief astrologers. Like you know, all the wealthy people in that region, if they wanted, you know, before they do a, a shadi or any kind of important function, they would always come to him to show him the horoscope. So. Yeah, I do have strong belief in that. Yes. Yes, yeah. V Vedic astrology. Yeah. Do you check the horoscope in the newspaper? Do do I check mine? So in like you know how I mentioned uh, Shushita and how there's a medical ethics. You know, astrologers we also have our own ethics. Um, you know, we don't check in general. We don't check our own families and our close relatives' horoscopes, because there's a conflict of interest. You know, we have understood that. Like, you know, are there any attorneys in the audience? No, so, but attorneys, you know, they will have this, they have this sort of conflict of interest and a lot of rules about who they can represent. So like that, you know, astrologers, we always do for third parties. We don't do it for ourselves. And I think that science has been lost. Like there are really few. It's no, it's no, that, that, that has been preserved. Been that that has been preserved because, uh, you know, when the invaders came, a lot of that, a lot of the uh, Vedic pundits from Maharashtra, Gujarat, they all travel. They all travel to uh, southern India. In fact, from Gujarat, there's a in Tamil Nadu, there's a group of people called uh, Saurashtra. They are they actually speak the Saurashtra language. So you know, but they're originally from Gujarat. But then, then if you think about it, Rama and Mahabharat, Mahabharat especially, they're talking about the missiles, they're talking about all those things. Yeah. So that knowledge was there or the description was there. Right. Yeah. There's actually a descri description of various, you know, you know helicopter-like vehicles, like push not just push them on, others too, and they've given diagrams. And they've also done research, you know, Kurukshetra on the ground, and they find some residual... Uh, you know, when they do the nuclear testing, radioactive testing, they find some, you know, radioactive particles in the ground there. And also, like, chakra view and, like, the... Right. Like the... Military formations. Right. We still have five, ten minutes. We are not having that. Okay. So, I, I was born. Sorry, repeat. I don't think I was born. Are you, 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 are
I was born in Bangalore and I came here at a very young age. So I had a lot of my education here. But, you know, I always remain in touch with my roots. So every, you know, one one year or every two years, I like to go back to India and visit all the important, you know, Tirpa styles and all that. What is the place and I think you need to know the introduction. Yeah, right. So if you can begin in a place, if you small. Sure. Yeah, my name, my name is Sugan Khan. I am a, you know, I'm a long time native of South Florida, I live in Western. I graduated from Wharton Business School. It's the number one business school in the world. That's where Google CEO, Sundar Pichai, Elon Musk, Ambani, they all have studied there. Uh, Mitt Trump and also <laughs> Trump and also uh, Lakshmi Metal, you know, Metal Steel, they also studied there. So, you know, now I run a management consulting business focused on healthcare and real estate management. So I travel around the country and I give promotions and lectures like this to spend, spread good message and mainly, you know, motivate the youngsters so they understand and they can carry forward the next generation and maintain the traditions. Uh, for my family background, I come, you know, I'm a direct descendant of Atreya Maharishi. In the Mahabharata itself, in the Shanti Parva, Bhishma says that Atreya Maharishi is the foremost authority on Ayurveda. And my great grandfather on my maternal and paternal side, they were very learned Vedic Pandits. So I learned a lot from them and I keep the tradition going forward. So can you read Sanskrit and? Yeah, I know how to chant Sanskrit mantras. And... But uh, like you can teach translation. Yes. Do you believe the knowledge? It con continues to get propagated to the newer generation. Like you are here now, but I, that would that change continue or you know, at some point? Yeah, the main challenge with the generation, the second generation here, is you know the first generation they came and they you know, they built they built the wealth and you know, they built nice temples like this, and they run the Sunday programs. But you also need a lot of strong push from the family and the household. That's really critical. And, you know, the, the great way to develop that is to, you know, take a few trips back to India, visit, you know, important stalls and, you know, teach them the, the greatness. And, you know, of course, eat good food as well when you go to India. That's that's really, you know, mirchi bhaji, sweets, those are all, they taste a lot better here than they, there than they do in, you know, a restaurant like Woodlands. Okay. I, I have a question. In, in our Jain center, we have the same problem. Whoever came from India, first generation, everybody uh, like you know, participating. But all of our second generation, like most of the year, nobody else, I mean, up to the high school, they are okay, they come here, but they are all wrong. I mean, like, so, what's, what we can do to motivate them? Going back to the center, right? You know, I all like when they can come. Right, right. Yeah, Jane. I mean, to you know, practicing your faith is very important. You know, that that is that is what gives you the strength to continue in your professional career. I think that needs to be impressed upon youth, upon the Jain youth, and you know, coming to Mandir often is very critical. But like I mentioned, you know. And coming to the Patashala, you know, that's all that's all good. That forms the you know the seed or the beach. But to develop it further, you need strong backup and support from the household, you know, teaching them the various aspects at a very young age. Starting very young is very important. Because once the students, once the young children, they reach the once they reach the uh, middle school or high school. You know, they get exposed to a lot of other ideas, maybe negative or bad ideas. So they kind of lose the tradition. But if you start it from a very young age, you know, three, four, five, six, we start from that age itself, you know, having speaking only Gujarati or Marathi or uh, Hindi or Bhojpuri at the house, you will you know, be able to develop that traditional mindset. You know, <laughs> that, that's very important. In fact, I encourage everyone here, your mother tongue is very important. So when your kids 
You should always mandate that they speak only the mother tongue in the house, not English. They're not, but they don't want to publish my Keep it simple. Please and faith does not have to be so complicated or so difficult to comprehend. Keep it fun, keep it simple. As long as your child or everybody's child is a good human being, that's all that matters. No, no, I mean, yes, I, mean, I, I, I think it's all for everybody here. All of our kids are all good human beings. Moral value wise, I'm sure, 100%. That's all that we need. But I, I understand, but there are such, certain things still like. They're not carrying that tradition. No, not only right. tradition, like, you see, whatever we say, like everybody says, like we have so many books and everything, you know. What I want our kids to take a pride in our uh, old culture and own incident. And like I just said, you know, propagate that message, be like, you know, ambassador of that, say, hey, no, I want the way the Sugan is doing it here. Right. That's missing. Right. 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 On the web, and our kids, we wanted our kids to accept in here. Everybody's needs are excellent, yeah. and we focus on excelling our kids right. on, on the here. And that's where we lost the the because they are comparing the two words and then that we thought like you know, like if we teach our language at all, they will be bad in English and they will not come yeah. to do that. That's what. That's what it, uh, yeah, actually, actually on that, there's recently been a, a research done. You know, they looked at, if you look at uh, countries that put out strong scientific and technological uh, innovation, you look at uh, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, they've actually shown that in that country, they are only educated in their mother tongue, Danish, Dutch, uh, Swedish. They only talk in their mother tongue and they innovate in their mother tongue. Germans you know, very strong in manufacturing. So education in mother tongue is, is very critical. Like if you go back to India, you know, everybody's goal as parents even there is, oh, I want my kid to study in the top, you know, convent Catholic school. So they, they learn in English, you know, schools like Don Bosco and the top schools. You know, each city that it has their top uh, private English uh, CBSE school. But, you know, I think learning in the mother tongue and doing that, there's nothing wrong with that. And you can complete, co compete at a global level. Yeah. Right, right. Any more questions anywhere? I know it was a very, very good discussion. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, you start asking the question first time I saw it. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, we'll keep in touch and sure. we we'll try to every quarter some program like this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, when, when people come to speak, you know, whether it be here or any other uh, presentation, it is always important for the youngsters to be bold and ask questions. Yes. Now, I've always seen that's a bit of a challenge, but it's important for them to, you know, put their mind and thoughts forward. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you again. Uh, thank very you. excellent. Uh, and I guess everybody thinks the way you think it and uh, will do better. Okay. Next week, uh, we have a minor one. The program that we get for Vapal Maharaj is cancelled because of health reason. After that, we have Samriji. And then everybody knows February 11th. We have a general body meeting. And please, if you are not paid the due for the this year, make sure you pay the due for this year. Help the help the game center. Uh, today's lunch sponsor is uh Paragan Abhilasha. Thank you, Paragan Abhilasha. Okay, let's do the RT and interview. Okay, good. I hope share something. Some of us are involved in some free yoga that's been going on from India. It's a very good platform. If anybody is contemplating uh, getting their lives and bodies in good shape, 
uh, I can share the link. Basically, um, we did three weeks. Tomorrow is the last day of the pre session, and then the pre cycle starts. Um, easy version, difficult version. I myself a yoga instructor, and I do yoga every single day. But after doing his class, I found that there were so many aspects I was missing. Like he does different breathing every day, the cardio, like different. Even I was kind of sore in some of my muscles after a few days. 